And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Aziza, who during her operation had a near-death experience, which we're going to learn about and more. Aziza, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you for having me. Aziza, if you don't mind, let's start on the day that you had the operation and go from there. I was newly dating someone. And he had only went skiing once. And I was a competitive snowboarder. I did half pipes, rails since the sixth grade. And at this point, I was um, 18. And so I was going on a date. I was going to take him out skiing and I was going to snowboard. And my plan was I am going to show off and like look so cool. And so I was having dinner with my family. And my mom was like, please don't go. Don't go. And I'm like, why? And she's like, I have a really bad feeling. I don't know why. Just please don't go. I'm like, I am so going. I had. I had such a big crush on this guy. Uh, and you know how we're very stubborn when we're young and we have to learn the hard way, at least I do. Um, so off I went. And we were going up on the ski lift. And it was a... Boy, it must have been around nine. It was later at night and it was kind of busy. It was a weekend and I looked down and it didn't look like we were that far off the ground up on the ski lift. And I look at him and I was like, do you want to see something really cool? And he's like, I guess. And I, oh man, I grabbed on to the rail that goes over you and it's basically a safety rail that goes around the whole sea lift and when you grab it there's two of them one goes down after the other the first one you rest your skis or your snowboard on goes underneath you and the second one is in front of you for protection and what I did was I grabbed onto the first one that goes under you. And I was like, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to so land this. It doesn't look that high. Let me grab this. I grabbed the first rail and I went under the ski lift. And I did not think it would be that hard for me to hold on until I was ready to land it. But it was so slippery. And I literally fell off, fell down. And it was so, it was like slow motion. And I was like, I'm not going to land this. I am not prepared. And it was so quiet. I could not hear anything. It was slow motion and quiet. And I could just see myself getting closer to the ground. And bam, I fell. And I blacked out. And I remember opening my eyes again and looking above me. And there were people, of course, still on the ski lift going over me. And they're like, oh, man, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not okay. And all of a sudden, I could feel all this pain throughout my whole body. And it was a couple of guys and they were like, I think she's getting around. And I took all my might to scream. I'm not kidding. I need help. And at this point, I am praying to God that they literally did go get help. And at this point, my boyfriend had already made it off the lift and asked for help which I am not thinking about at this time. I am thinking, please, somebody send help. Um, And I blacked out again after using all my strength to scream 
please help me. And again, I come to and open my eyes and there are people with red jackets around me. And they're like, okay, hon, you're gonna be okay. We're gonna take you to the ambulance. And it was a woman and two other men and I could hear the snowmobiles. Um, so they were obviously first aid and they were talking to me and they said, we're just gonna gently lift you on to the back of the snowmobile and we're gonna get you down this hill. And I was like, okay. I just, I was in so much pain and I had no strength. I, I really didn't say much. <clears throat> so as they moved my arm to put across my chest and get me on to the back of the snowmobile, I screamed. It hurt so bad for them to even touch my arm. And they said, I think her wrist is broken. And they grabbed the other one and I screamed again. And they said, I think both her, the woman, she said, I think both of her wrists are broken. They're like, we're so sorry. We're so sorry, honey. We're almost done. And then they lifted me on to the back of the snowmobile and it was just immense pain. I, I cried and screamed all the way down. You could feel every little bump. And I know that they were trying to do their best. They were just doing their job. Um, I don't remember getting transferred into the ambulance. I wasn't conscious for that, I guess. I do remember opening my eyes and being in the ambulance and screaming in pain. And I I told them, I said, I'm so sorry for screaming. I'm so sorry for screaming. I'm in a lot of pain. And they're like, you don't have to apologize. It's okay. You'll be fine. It's okay. And they cut off all of my, my jacket, my snow pants. They cut everything off. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was so upset. And they're like, no, we have to do this. And I blacked out again. And I came to once I was in the um, x-ray room when they were doing the CT scans and the x-rays. And once they lifted me into the CT scan machine, I screamed, screamed in so much pain. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I keep screaming. They're like, no, no, it's okay, honey. It's okay, honey. And what I came to realize after everything was that why I would become aware or conscious is because I was being moved and screaming in pain. When I was being transferred in any way is when I would wake up and scream in pain. So again, I became conscious and aware, opened my eyes as I'm being transferred off that metal table and back onto the hospital uh, trans transfer bed, screaming again. And I said, I'm so sorry, you guys. I keep screaming. I am like being a really hard patient. I don't mean to be. And they said, oh, honey, you don't have to apologize for screaming. You do not need to apologize at all. And when she said that, I kind of wondered, like, something really bad must be on those scans because that doesn't sound good. <clears throat> and so next thing I know, I opened my eyes. I blacked out again. I just kept blacking out. And the doctor was trying to talk to me, and he was at the foot of my bed. And he said... I didn't even know where I was. I knew I was somewhere in the hospital because there were two drapes. My parents showed up out of nowhere on each side of the bed. I don't know where they came from. but And the doctor was at the end of my bed saying, we need to do surgery right away. We need to do surgery. We're going to need to um, put some rods and screws in your back because you completely crushed your vertebrae. And that scared me to death. 
Um, I screamed at him. I said, nobody's touching me. Nobody's, I don't want surgery. I don't like surgery. And I blacked out again. Um, I remember after that, it was crazy. I was somewhere where it was just bright and it was, I felt weightless. And I noticed in front of me, there's like a, like a C shape of other young adults. And we're, it was almost like we were um, standing on clouds. It was so bright and weightless and warm. And you almost felt like you were floating. And I didn't know who these other people were. I was so confused. So confused because I felt like every time I became conscious and aware, something crazy was happening. Like I, every time something crazy was happening. And so I'm like, what is going on now? And all these other young adults were just standing calm. And I looked straight ahead of me. And there was a man, a very old elderly man, and he was it was almost like a white, um, like a white robe, and these like bright white lights of his hair was so white and long that it was it appeared just like it was bright light. Um, and he had blue eyes and he had a lot of wrinkles in his face and he had a long white beard and, um, he looked really, really sad. So sad. And he kept, he, he'd look at a young adult in front of me because it was me. And then about eight other young adults in a C shape. And then there was him. <clears throat> and so he looked at the one of the young adults and he looked so sad and so heartbroken and so disappointed. And he looked at them and then he would just look so Slowly, he would lower his head. You could just see, like, a tear. And then that person would disappear and fall into the clouds. And I'm like, what is going on? But I could sense where I was, and I could sense what was happening. But I almost was in disbelief. And I could hear what, what he was saying. I could sense what he was saying. There is no speaking, you know, um, and you're so light and warm and, and it feels like you're floating. There's, there was no pain or anything that you feel like you don't have a body, but everybody I've seen in front of me had a body and he had a body and it to me, I thought it was God. He didn't look like Jesus or um, like any of the pictures of Jesus. But uh, yeah, all I knew was there was a lot of sadness and disappointment. Um, like a father and his children. And he kept doing that one after another with each person. And when he got to the third one in front of me, he again looked at them and looked down with like such a broken heart and like so much sadness. And then this young adult had fallen just like and like something comes under your feet and they literally just drop, but I seen flames. And the worst screams I've ever heard. And I don't ever want to hear them again. 
these flames came out from the the clouds, the bright light of clouds that we're standing on. It was horrid. And it killed him to see this happen and to watch it happen. And he did it to the next person. And then again, so he came to me and he did the same thing. And again, there aren't any words. Um, it's basically, it's, it's pretty much like telepathy. Um, and he said, you know, I love you so much. I don't know why. Um, why you made the choices you do and you did. Why you made the choices that you did. But I forgive if you ask. And I love you. Um, and he was so sad. And his heart was broken. And to me, I felt terrible. I, oh my goodness, I know. I was raised Catholic and I knew the life I was living was um, horrible. I mean, let me tell you, it was horrible. Like worse than your average teenager. And um, I had strayed, strayed away from God for sure. <clears throat> and then it was my time to drop into the flames. But I, I didn't. Just as I was about to, just as I was supposed to drop, um, I woke up. I remember I had woke up because I'm thinking I'm going to be in flames. But I wasn't. I had tubes everywhere. I had a tube in my mouth. I had tubes going in here. I had blood, uh, blood transfusions. I, um, I was trying to rip everything out because I couldn't. But I felt like I was choking because you're not supposed to wake up with all of those tubes. And I'm like, what is going on? Every time I wake up, this, it was just crazy every time I woke up. So I see the nurses rushing when I'm trying to pull everything out. And they now I know they forced me into a medical coma uh, because I was so, so badly injured. Um. When I did wake up after that, I I woke up trying to comprehend what in the heck happened. And am I gonna black out again? And like, what? Hey, what's gonna happen right now? What crazy is gonna happen right now? But nothing happened, and there was. My family around me. My aunt was at the foot of the bed. And my boyfriend was sitting to my right. And I was in a full body cast. And I couldn't ask anything because of um, my, I, I was literally working off of one lung. <clears throat> but once I had healed and went through all the therapy, I did find out that uh, when I was gone, it was when I was on the operating table, um, when I needed five blood transfusions. So I kind of put the pieces together like, wow, this really happened. Because when I was able to talk and feed myself again I told my dad what happened and he couldn't believe it he said you know that they like we did lose you and I'm like what he's like yeah we we lost you on the operating table and I'm like oh my goodness like this this makes sense um and I realized that I had a second chance um uh, and I do wonder if, if 
the other young adults in front of me, did they get second chances? Was it a warning? Um, I'm praying they got second chances like me. Um, I had found out that the the um, the the uh, boy oh boy from the ski lift to the ground was forty feet. It was four stories, so I definitely underestimated that. Um, my I was in shock, so I did keep blacking out, and I had ended up fracturing both of my wrists. Uh, I have a screw and oh boy six screws in one plate in each wrist because I broke both of them and then I broke four ribs which collapsed my I broke four left ribs which collapsed my left lung so when I took all my might to scream it was because I only had one lung and was filling up with blood I had completely crushed my vertebrae in between my L and T. So they had to use three rods and 22 screws to fix that. Um, I had fractured my pelvic bone, my left hip, and my left leg, um, my thigh, basically my upper leg. And um, I had to learn how to breathe and, and exercise my left lung with one of those breathing <laughs> exercisable things. Uh, I had to use soup cans uh, once I got my cast off to exercise with. Um, I couldn't believe when my therapist cheered me on when I did two steps up the stairs. It was like, in my head, I'm thinking the things we take for granted <laughs> that we do every day. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, yeah. It's, I spent a long time in the hospital and a long, long time uh, healing the basically the the back cast or oh my goodness the cast went all the way around uh <laughs> like I don't know how to describe it um it's like a body cast it was like, yeah it was like a body cast <laughs> I did get to go home with just a temporary cast over my wrist and yeah, by the time I went home, I had a temporary cast on both wrists. And then I only had a body caster on my mid middle area. So yeah, I, I went through a lot and um, definitely humbled me a lot. And I think God gave me a second chance and people, People say a lot, like, you're so lucky he gave you a second chance. I wish, you know, they. I've had someone say, I wish he gave my son a second chance. And I try to explain to people, um, we, we may have been given so many chances already <laughs> that we don't even know it. We could have been in a car accident today, but it didn't happen. Um, Close calls happen all the time. So a lot of people, um, you know, say, you're so lucky, you're so lucky. I am lucky that I got a wake up call and I got a chance to, to completely turn my life around and be there for others. Um, I don't know. Uh, I try to make people laugh and I'm, I, a lot of people are drawn to me just to listen, just to listen to them. 
now. So um, now it's all about me helping people. Um, I have to be helping someone to have purpose. I don't know why. And since my accident, which was in uh, 2009, um, I've had my daughter, uh, the boyfriend, um, stayed and fed me, bathed me, drove me to doctor appointments, gave me my daughter, um, has completely turned his life around. Um, I guess I impressed him. <laughs> Aziza, thank you for sharing your story with us. When you were first over there and you saw all the other young adults in the C formation, did you have some sort of understanding that you were dead? Uh, not in the beginning. But as soon as he started, um, when he first, I, at first, you know, when I got there, I was like, who are these people? But then when I noticed him and how he was looking at one of the young adults, I was like, oh, dear. That's what I noticed. I'm bad. Have you ever considered that sending someone back to Earth could be like sending them to hell? Yeah. Because ever since, uh, I've, I have everything but cancer. After your experience, did you notice that you had any new abilities that could be considered psychic? No, not until I was an adult. I do, uh, you know, I think everybody does have a gut feeling. It's just that people don't trust it. But uh, every time I get a gut feeling, it's for a reason. And then I have a lot of dreams that come true. But they're warnings. I don't think it's type of um, thing that I've come back with. I think it's something that I wasn't aware of until I was an adult. Because as a young teenager, we just don't pay attention to stuff as well. Since your experience, have you returned to Catholicism? No. I'm a Christian. But I am not Catholic. Would you say you've become more religious? Yeah. In what other ways did your life change? At least spiritually or your relationships with people? My whole life had changed. Um, my purpose is completely different. Um, I moved from Minnesota to Arizona to get my RN to be able to help people even more. <clears throat> um, I do, me and uh, me and my other half, we we do not hang out with the same people anymore. Um, and my daughter. She goes to a Christian school. So, and I, I'm definitely bringing her up to be, to be aware that God is always there for you. Um, our life here is, is such a, such a tiny minute, minute amount of time for our soul compared to eternity. Um, whenever there's an issue or you're starting to feel uh, depressed or alone or anxious, uh, I believe what it's true that everything makes you stronger. You're, you're able to go through whatever is presented to you. You can make it through it. You're never alone. You may feel like you're alone. But you never are. Um, and I teach that to my daughter. You know, if you're having a hard week at school, or if you're upset about something, 
uh, I help her to pray about it. Pray before your day starts and give thanks for everything. I, I tell her that everything could change in one one second, and the other side of the country is flooding. They, you know, they lost their home, um, and it's true. Anything can change in a second. I've I've experienced that. I think a lot of people have. So just being very thankful. Uh, I'm definitely. I definitely have more gratitude. I'm more humble. And I think about others a lot before, you know, before making a decision because it's not all about you. Do you fear death? No. How are you inspired by your experience? If you feel like you've done something wrong or if you feel bad, just ask for forgiveness. Because God is always there and he's, he's willing to forgive his children. All you have to do is ask. Um, yeah. I know that before, right before the accident, I could have cared less about that I didn't pray I wasn't going to church um we were uh we were selling drugs um my gosh we were partying literally looked like the worst <laughs> it was terrible um yeah I just Yeah, I mean, realize what you've done and the people you hurt, and you pray to God he forgives you. If you had a friend that was suffering over the loss of a loved one, what type of advice would you give? I would tell them that where they are, there is no pain, they're not in pain. And... But they're still alive, just not here. And to pray, you know, if you if you're really missing them, pray to God. Pray to God to help you with your pain, and pray to God, you know, please, dear God, tell my loved one that I miss them so much. Or, yeah, they're never truly. No one's ever truly dead. It's just a whole different realm that we go to. Aziza, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Um, yeah. What's the best way to contact you? Let's see. I have my email. Or I have a Facebook. Facebook page? A profile? Yeah. Should I Facebook put a link message. to it? Yeah, that's fine. If people want to Facebook message me, um and they want to know more, that's fine. Do you have anything that you're working on that you want people to know about? Not really. Um, let's see. I guess my, my experience had, uh, has led me down the, the um, healthcare career because I feel like it's the best way I can help people. Um, me and my mom used to, we did used to help the homeless. Um, we would hand out backpacks with, you know, toothbrushes and socks and necessities and snacks. Um, right now, I do start school for my RN. I'm halfway done with my RN. And I do start school again in August. And once I am done with that, I do want to continue and be a nurse anesthesiologist, which you do have to have three years of ER experience to be able to apply for that school. But yeah, that's, I, I feel my best when I'm helping others. And I've been a CNA for 15 years. So. Well, that's great. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wanted to wait for my daughter to get a little bit older to start RN school because it is difficult. I know how hard it is. So, um, yeah. And then um, my one last message to for everybody is to forgive yourself and forgive others because guilt and regret is so heavy on our on our souls on our hearts so remember to forgive yourself ask for forgiveness and forgive others and there's always hope there is you know it's always memories and people are so much more important than any materialistic things because our feelings and our memories are priceless they're irreplaceable so always forgive, always love, love each other, respect each other, because in the end, that's all we have is each other. So we rely on, on God for a lot of that, to help us to forgive others and to help us overcome our own obstacles and our own struggles that we're going through. So never give up. Always have hope and love. Aziza. Thank you for having me. Aziza, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.